So now a little bit about the outputs to the project. Um, there are three primary outputs, I guess four primary outputs, and we'll walk through them a bit now. So we'll just give a general overview of what they are, and then a little bit more detail as we proceed forward. So first off is a flow direction raster. So at one meter resolution, this raster just defines the direction of any of the eight cardinal directions with each cell um, that we would expect flow to go into. Like So from, for every cell, which neighbor are you going to flow into? Um, that information can be used to, s to summarize all these flow directions into what's called a flow accumulation raster. So this is essentially just an accumulated flow of all other cells um, upstream of any particular cell where we have a, a running tally of how many upstream cells exist uh, relative to any other cell in the landscape. Uh, and finally we have the wet areas rasters that uh, hopefully we all know and love as well as the predicted stream channel vectors. So these just identify those, those uh, channel locations or open water features that we would predict uh, to exist across the landscape. So now just a bit more detail on, on each of these data sets. So the flow direction raster is uh, an integer raster uh, in the ESRI format. Uh, as I had mentioned, it, it defines flow in each of the eight cardinal directions or, or in any of the eight cardinal directions adjacent to every single cell. Uh, so we have basically a flow direction code that exists in each of these one meter cells that will define the direction of flow for each of those cells. So the raster itself uh, has, you know, a symbology uh, that you know defines the cardinality and the flow directions based off of each of these these codes, right? So when we bring in a flow direction raster, it doesn't look like much. It looks very noisy. It doesn't mean a lot to us visually. Um, but these data sets are very useful within different GIS software suites um, that understand the logic of the flow direction codes that are implemented. Uh, and this is a fairly standard um, coded flow direction scheme. So ArcGIS uses this scheme. A lot of other ones like Grasswood as well, if anyone's familiar with any of these other software suites, GIS software suites. Uh, this data set can be very useful for watershed delineation and for um, particle tracking, so flow path analysis. So from a watershed delineation perspective, if we know the direction of flow, uh, or the, yeah, the direction of flow, I guess, uh, for every one meter cell, we can very easily identify very accurate watershed boundaries, right? Uh, and also from a particle tracking perspective, uh, this flow direction informs, you know, if we spill a, a bottle of water or we have an oil breach or whatever else there may be, uh, this can tell us the direction that this flow is going to take. Um, there are other flow partitioning algorithms that exist. Um, I don't know how much technical detail we should be going into, but there's multiple flow direction, convergent and divergent flows, um, some other more advanced ones, uh, but we've tended to stay with the D8 uh, flow direction and flow accumulation methodologies currently for this project, and this works very well for us. Um, and the next output is the flow accumulation raster, which is a, a floating point raster. Uh, it's informed by the flow direction, and as I mentioned, it's a running tally essentially of the upstream contributing area to every single cell across the landscape. So again, we have our, our flow accumulation values. Uh, there's a symbology, in this case, we'll just say it's from, from one to 100 in terms of how many cells upland exist of, that would flow into any particular cell. And so this is kind of what a flow accumulation raster would look like. So there are some other potential uses for this data set as well. It can be very useful for defining stream channels uh, through a channel initiation thresholding methods, and I'll show some of these as we proceed, uh, as well as potential indicators of flow significance. So we would assume that areas of higher flow accumulation would have higher significance in terms of uh, headwater um, potential flow, um, nutrient fluxing through those areas that are going to have higher flow accumulation values as well. So you know this is kind of some of the work that you might use for the, the flow accumulation rasters. So in terms of the stream thresholding, the stream initiation thresholding that I previously mentioned, um, if we start to look at these LiDAR cells at one meter resolution, each cell covers an extent of you know, one one thousandth of a hectare. So four hectares of area, contributing area, would be about 40,000 cells. So if we take our original symbology for this data set and we threshold it at 40,000 cells, then we can start to define a rasterized version of a channel network, right? And other methods can be then used to vectorize that, stra that channel network. So next off, if we wanted to kind of change that from a four hectare contributing area to an eight hectare contributing area, that would be 80,000 cells, right? And we can see now that the, the channel network is more conservative because more contributing area is required before any channelization would be expected to occur. So that's kind of some of the work that you can use for a flow accumulation raster.
Uh, next is the, the wet areas mapping data sets. Uh, so there's a couple different formats for the wet areas rasters as we deliver them. Uh, the first is we tend to call it just the raw raster, which is a floating point ESRI raster, where we have one floating point or decimal value of our predicted depth to water raster for every single one meter cell across the landscape. When you bring it into a GIS software suite, it just kind of shows like shades of gray. Um, so we have to apply a symbology to that. And, and as I mentioned, we tend to use these shades of blue. So uh, 0 to 0.1 meters would be a, a darker blue. And all the way up through, as you can see, to the, uh, the 50 centimeters to 1 meter class uh, with a lighter shade of blue. And again, we tend to just, uh, the data set or the values outside of this, this area we tend to just show as transparent, and, but it is important to remember that you know values do exist within this, right? So, uh, in terms of integrating this into uh, any other modeling processes, uh, values exist for every single cell across the landscape. So, cell values can remain unchanged, and depending on how we choose to symbolize this data, uh, we can arrive at you know very different uses for the data. You know, if we were to symbolize this differently, we could have a dry areas map. Right, areas that have a, a very high value, you could potentially find these areas, query them out, and define these for areas of uh, potential risk for fire fuel load and mapping and, and different things like that. So, you know, wet areas maps also predict dry areas. It's important to remember that as well. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, that's a very functional data set. So this would definitely be the data set to use if you were going to integrate this into other planning, planning models or uh, just basically any more in-depth analysis. The next data set that we deliver that most people tend to, uh, to use first is the, the wet areas mapping uh, color map GeoTIFF. So this is just a TIFF data set that can be opened in Microsoft Paint all the way out to any of the GIS softwares. Uh, and we, for this we basically have uh, an integer code for every single <coughs> wet areas raster across the landscape. So what you see here is just values of 1 to 4. Each of these classes, or 1 to 5 I guess, each of these classes represent those various depth of water classes that I showed previously. So the raster essentially looks very much the same when we're only interested in looking at the, the wet areas information for within each of these tiles. And the value to this is, you know, if you're going out to do different field work, we can take there are rasters that might be up to a gigabyte in size and compress them down to about 10 megabytes for the GeoTIFF. So if we're trying to load a bunch of these tiles onto a handheld GPS for some field reconnaissance, uh, the GeoTIFF would definitely be the way to go because it's a lot more efficient and effective way to, to visualize the data. Uh, next, we have our stream channel vectors, right? So uh, within the, these wet area zones, as I previously showed, we have these predicted stream channel locations. Uh, in the previous versions, there wasn't much in the way of stream attribution associated with these data sets. But in, in the latest versions, we have started to apply some, some different stream attribution uh, adopted from this uh, TauDem software suite. So now we'll just kind of talk a little bit, a bit about some of this attribution that's been incorporated into the, the current version of the model. So from uh, a net, just a network routing perspective, uh, we now have identification attributes for any, every upstream and downstream link associated with any particular stream channel segment for every single vector line. There's also you know, some simple stream ordering associated with the, the trailer stream ordering uh, methodology. We have upstream and downstream contributing area for each of these channel vectors. So with that, we can start to identify the, the headwater potential upstream of an area as well as you know, the distance to outlet potentially um, downstream of any, any channel or every vector within the channel. And next, we have a straight line and natural length of each of these segments. So this can start to inform ideas of stream sinuosity, right? If we have uh, a length a natural length that's much longer than the straight line length, then we can safely assume that there's a lot of meanders and things going on within this channel. So with that, we can start to get potentially some ideas of um, you know, the speed of the flow throughout this area and different things like that. So these are attributes that now currently exist. As well as some stream drop and slope information. So you know the rise at the, at the top end versus the bottom end of each of these stream channeled segments, as well as you know the drop versus the total length of this segment. So you know again, using the, the straight line length information and the slope information, we can start to get some ideas of, of speed of, uh, of flow within some of these channels. As well as the distance to base and outlet. So essentially that's distance from every one of these vectors to the outlet, which tends to be towards the edge of a, a LiDAR tile um, for each of these stream, stream vectors, right? So this is information that might be useful in terms of uh, time to travel uh, from every single point within the vector to the outlet of this tile. And, you know, it's 
each of these raster attributes or vector attributes exists, um, but we have to remember that each of these vectors, when we apply only a single value to each of these vectors, we have these values you know, across every single one meter cell in the landscape. So we've tried to come up with you know, the values for the upstream and downstream contributing areas, as well as the distance to outlet from the start, the middle, and the end of each of these vectors, just to try to get a little bit more information uh, that might be potentially useful to some of you folks out there. So some of the limitations that we've been dealing with. Originally, when this project started, um, it was essentially used as a forest operations planning model for hydrological risk. So they just wanted to know, you know, where should we operate, where should we not operate, and where should we operate with more care. Um, as this project has advanced and, and iterate, iterated forward, there's been a lot more call in terms of having more accurate information, not only from the extent, but also from the attributes that we associate with these different data layers. Um, so, as I had mentioned, when we do our edge expansion, we currently expand out about two kilometers relative to the edge of each of these LiDAR tiles. So, from a flow accumulation perspective, we can have issues with have, having proper flow accumulation values associated with each of these tiles. Because, again, when we expand the edges, we're still assuming that we have just a slightly larger island that we're dealing with. Um, so, in theory, uh, with the two kilometer edge expansion, we could potentially have a, a minimum catchment area of 0.2 of a hectare. This is actually never really the case because more often than not, flow never really continues directly from every upward cell in a straight line down towards uh, the edge, right? More often than not, we have you know, meandering channels that have flow coming in from the sides and from the top. So in actuality, the flow accumulation values for everything under three to five hundred hectares of contributing area at the edge, we can safely assume are accurate, but things larger than that, say we have you know, a catchment area of 10,000 hectares upstream of this particular LiDAR tile, it's only going to show you know, three to five hundred hectares of that within the area. So that's one of the limitations that we're currently dealing with. Um, you know, in, but in terms of small ephemerals and things like that, we can be very confident in, in terms of the, the flow accumulation um, values that we assign to each of these vectors. So some of the field work that we've undertaken so far. Um, it, within EMEN, we've had different grad students in through there uh, for the past uh, five or six years, I think now. Um, yeah, from 2008 into 2012, some in a little bit in 13. Uh, we've done a bit of work in terms of just GPS boundaries of these wet area zones, as well as the hydrological connectivity between these zones. So it's important for us, and I, I would assume for you guys as well, to know not just the extent of these wet area zones, but how connected are they? Are they connected through a channel or just through potentially a saturated soil layer? And oftentimes these can't be very apparent in the field. So having these, these maps can, can kind of help to identify these zones that you might, uh, you might run into. So as you can see in this, this area right here, we're not predicting any channel between these two, um, but this was a, a connected area based on the vegetation that some of our, our field staff you know, verified out there with their GPSs. Uh, again, some of just the, the boundaries and connectivity. This is uh, an ortho winch taken from a helicopter uh, while they were out there, and we just tried to do kind of a crude representation of the outline of this wet area boundary relative to the boundary that was predicted based off of these wet areas rasters. So we can see based on the vegetation that there's a pretty good correspondence uh, to this, this large wetland complex. So that's just you know a bit of, of the work that we've been, been undertaking. There's also been some work, this stuff was done in Conklin, which is kind of just over south of Fort McMurray. And it might be kind of difficult to see on these images, but what we're trying to show here is the, the different forest conditions that we can expect within the different wood areas classes uh, associated with this data. So uh, up here we're starting to look at the, the outermost classes, so the 50 centimeters to one meter class. We can, we can see it still looks fairly dry, but it can be very productive, right? Um, there's no real evidence of, of much moisture on the forest floor. As we move into the, the higher or the lower depth water classes, as we move towards the center of these features, we started to get into grassier areas and then into some bog features. So, you know, this is just a bit of a representation of some of what you might see on the ground relative to some of these you know, shades of blue that you'll see on your maps. Uh, some other field work that's been undertaken that's just been uh, actually released for publication, I found out this morning, um, is some comparisons in Sweden uh, in this. Uh, 
the Kirkland the Research Watershed, uh, comparing the topographic wetness index, which is another uh, landform-based uh, topographic wetness index, um, compared to the predictive wet areas mapping that we do here. So what they did for that was they just did some transects from upland to lowland through the transitions uh, to try to, to correlate, um, you know, to try to determine which is going to be the most efficient uh, methodology for uh, soil moisture modeling across the landscape. 